Hello, I'm Todd Maidema, game designer and creator of Electrify. I created this game to teach people about the challenges and opportunities in electricity, especially how we can shift to more renewable electricity. This is important to help reduce the short and long-term consequences of pollution and climate change. So I'm here today to talk about the basics of electricity markets. So let's get started. First, what is electricity? At its most basic, it's just a source of energy that's very easy for us to use. We use it to power our phones, cars, microwaves, even our robots. But it's not found in nature, at least in large quantities. Uh, sure, there's lightning and static electricity, but you aren't exactly going to be able to power a car by rubbing two cats together. So we have to make it from other types of energy that are more abundant in nature. These include things like fossil fuels, coal and oil, hydroelectricity, so the running of water in rivers, nuclear energy, such as plutonium and uranium, and the very abundant wind and solar energy that surrounds us on a daily basis. But before we can talk about the electricity markets, we have to establish a few vocab words about electricity itself. Don't worry, there's only four words. The first is volts, or how fast the electricity is moving. People often use this analogy of electricity being like water. So in this analogy, volts are how fast the water is flowing through a pipe. Some real world examples of volts. Your phone charger, five volts. Pretty slow electricity, but the high voltage power lines you see above highways those are 115,000 volts. So it's very fast, very dangerous electricity. The second term is amps, or how much electricity is moving. In the water analogy, this is how big or small the pipe is. In your daily life, your phone charger is around two amps, so a fairly small pipe. But your house is probably wired for 200 to 400 amps, so it's a very big pipe because it has to power a lot of appliances at the same time. You want to be able to charge multiple phones and a car and run your microwave all at the same time. So there's a lot of amps running through your house. Where it starts to get really important is when we talk about watts, which is volts times amps, or how much electricity is working right now. So with your phone, you're charging at about five volts times two amps is 10 watts. So that's a little bit of work, but you know, your phone's a fairly small device. It's not drawing a lot of power. On the other hand, flooring a Tesla Model S can draw up to 438,000 watts. So it's doing a lot more work, drawing a lot more electricity as you push down that pedal. But that doesn't describe everything we want to know, because flooring a car is a much faster experience than charging your phone. So that's where this concept of watt hours comes in. It's watts over time. It's a measure of the total work done. So in our previous example, a Tesla Model S accelerates 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds. That's really fast. That's 0 0.00067 hours. So that's 438,000 watts over that tiny sliver of time. That's 293 watt hours, which is the same as charging your phone at 10 watts for 29 hours. But it, this acceleration is in under three seconds. So it's really important to understand that concept of both watts with the instantaneous draw and watt hours with the total amount of energy consumed. Because when electricity companies talk about electricity, they use those two terms extensively. So when power companies talk about watts, they're thinking, how much energy do I need to provide right now? How many people have their light bulbs on and their TVs on? Uh, how many power plants do I need to have producing electricity right now? And then when they think about watt hours, it's how much power they need to produce over a unit of time, whether it be a day or a month or a year. So if you have your light bulb on right now, maybe it's drawing 10 watts. And so they need to turn on their, 
their 10 watt generator. But if you leave your light bulb on all day, that's 24 hours, so it's 240 watt hours that they need to provide you. And so maybe they leave that generator on all day, producing 10 watts an hour, or maybe they leave a solar panel out in the sun that draws a lot of energy when it's sunny out, and then they store that energy and sell it to you even when it's nighttime. You might also be familiar with watt hours because it's how you as a consumer get charged for electricity. On your electricity bill at the end of the month, you get charged a rate per kilowatt hour. It's usually 10 to 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, so now we have these four basic vocab words and we understand how electricity companies talk about electricity. But next, let's explore how they actually produce electricity or the value chain. So the first step is to acquire fuel, then generate that electricity, transmit it to cities, and then distribute it to your home. So acquiring fuel. Not all forms of electricity generation require fuel. Solar, wind power, these use fuel that's already around us. But for things like fossil fuels, they have to explicitly go out, find these fuels in the ground, extract them with mines or oil wells, and then refine them into something usable inside of a generator and transport it. Something like oil can be transported halfway across the world from the Middle East to your local power plant. Next, they generate electricity. So here's a handy graphic of where electricity in the United States came from in 2019. Now you'll notice that the largest percentage came from natural gas at 35%. When you look at it over time, you see that coal has actually been declining for more than a decade, and natural gas is now a cheaper and cleaner source of electricity than coal. So after natural gas, there's coal at 27%, and then there's nuclear at 19%. Yep, a fifth of our nation's energy comes from nuclear energy. So even though there's been a few big catastrophes in the past, with nuclear power plants, it's actually an incredibly reliable uh, source of electricity. It can operate 24-7, rain or shine. It uses very little fuel, and so it, its prices don't fluctuate with fuel markets. But they're very expensive to build, and it can be very challenging to get any community to allow a nuclear power plant in their backyard. The next big chunk is renewables at 17%. Even though that sounds like a lot, there's still a lot of space for us to grow and increase that number. If you look over to the left, you can see that hydro and wind represent most of that number, and solar is there at 1.6%. So hydro and wind have been mature technologies for many decades. Only recently has solar become as advanced and efficient as it is today, and it is now starting to become more profitable than any other source of electricity on this list. And so over the next few years and few decades, we are going to see that number go from 1.6 up to something much, much higher. How do companies deploy these generators, right? They have nuclear, they have solar, they have coal. How do they decide when to turn on their coal power plant or their nuclear power plant? Well, this here is a generation curve. This one is specifically from Pennsylvania in 2018. Uh, so, local example for those of us from Pittsburgh. And on the bottom axis, we can see that it's the generation output, or how much power the company has to provide at that moment. So as it goes left to right, the company needs to provide more and more power. On the vertical axis is the cost, or how much it costs the company to produce that power. So if we look in the bottom left, we can see that renewables are first, which kind of makes sense. Renewables basically don't cost any money to produce. If you already built a solar panel, it's going to produce power for free. So if companies just need to produce a little bit of power, they'll let the solar panels and, and the wind turbines do their job. Next up is nuclear. Like I mentioned a little bit before, nuclear is actually very, very cheap to produce because it uses so little fuel. It's so fuel efficient. But at the end of the day, companies only have so many solar panels and so many nuclear power plants, and as the demand for generation output increases, they have to start turning on other generators. In this example, the next thing that they'll turn on is their coal power plants. 
which are a little bit more expensive than renewables and nuclear. And then as demand continues to increase, they have to start turning on their natural gas power plants. And as we start to go to the right, you can see that cost starts to go up dramatically. On these hot summer days where everyone is turning on their air conditioning and demand for electricity is skyrocketing, these companies have to do anything they can to produce enough power to prevent blackouts. In those extreme situations, the cost for them to produce it skyrockets, and it's actually possible for them to lose money. Previously, we said that you might pay 10 or 20 cents per kilowatt hour on your electricity bill. Well, in this graph, that first little bit of power they produce with renewables and nuclear, that might only cost them four or five cents per kilowatt hour. But when we get over to that extreme hot summer day, it could cost them a hundred or even a thousand dollars per kilowatt hour to produce. So it's really challenging being an electricity company where you have to think about both of the extremes of this axis. Not only how do you produce most of your power very cheaply, but then what happens when you need to produce as much power as possible. So you've generated your electricity. You have to get it to the people who want it. Power plants, people generally don't like to live next to them, so they locate them out in the middle of nowhere, and they transmit it to cities via high voltage power lines with 100,000 volts. They're very efficient at transmitting power over long distances. Finally, when they get this power into the city, they have to get it down to your house. Now, these high voltage power lines there are 100,000 volts, but the outlet in your house is only 100 volts. And so these substations, which you might have seen around your city, one of their jobs is to step the voltage down from 100,000 to 100 so that it can be safely transmitted to your house. Now, the big challenge in all of this is that they need to provide this electricity exactly when you need it. Electricity is instantaneous. Here's a fascinating graph of the average hourly load across different weeks of the year in the mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, Maryland region. That first red line is hot summer day in July. That middle blue line is a cold January winter day. And that bottom black line is a nice spring day. And you can see just how much variation there is in demand for electricity. At its peak in the summer, they saw 50,000 megawatts of demand, but in the dead of a spring night, it went as low as 20,000 megawatts. And that demand varies by time of day as well. You can see how the curve kind of spikes a little bit in the morning, calms down a bit in the afternoon, and then spikes again in the evening. So you have to start thinking about how your different generation technologies play into that, because solar panels produce the most at noon, and produce nothing at night. So if you're gonna use a lot of solar panels, you have to store that electricity somehow. Or if you're using wind turbines, the wind often blows strongest at night. So when people are turning their air conditioners on in the middle of the day, how are you storing or how are you producing that electricity? So as you can see, there's a lot to think about that goes on behind the scenes anytime you plug your phone in. To recap, we talked about some vocab, the value chain, and some business challenges in the electricity market. For our vocab, we learned about volts, amps, and watts, which are volts times amps. And most importantly, we learned about watt hours, which are watts over time. Secondly, we talked about the value chain, which is that companies must acquire fuel, generate it by turning it into electricity, then transmit that electricity to cities, and finally step it down and distribute it to homes and businesses. And finally, we talked about some of the business challenges and opportunities in the electric market. Firstly, that electricity is instantaneous and all of these decisions must be made in the snap of a finger. Secondly, that demand fluctuates over time, over years, seasons, and even time of day. And finally, that technology is rapidly changing and even fuel prices change how companies might approach which generators they turn on first. Hopefully you enjoyed that overview. If you're interested in learning more and applying these concepts, you can check out Electrify at electrifygame.com. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thank you so much.